today I'm interviewing Robert L. Walker, who was born December 25, 1920, in Huntington, Indiana. Bob was in the U.S. Air Force in the 3rd Bomb Squadron of the 6th Air Force. Uh, Bob, uh, this, this is Mike Hayes doing the interview. Uh, Bob, uh, where uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, oh, I enlisted October the 29th, 1942. I wanted to be a pilot and uh, it was, <clears throat> everybody wanted to be a pilot at that time and so they uh, had gave us a test that held tests at Bear Field to uh, see if you could pass the uh, entrance exam. And that's where it really started. There was five of us that passed out of a group of 25. So it, it, they eliminated a lot of people in that. They uh, called to active duty in February of 19. 43. After I enlisted, they took all the tests and we went at home to wait on being called to active duty. They first sent us to uh, Keesler Field in Mississippi uh, and told us to wear the clothes that we had on because they would be issued uniforms as soon as we got there. Uh, so we got to Keesler Field, there was uh, <laughs> were no uniforms to be had. And they were, we were there for well over a week with wearing the same clothes, same shoes, almost same socks. <laughs> so, uh, well, snafus. And uh, about the only thing we did there was uh, walk to Gulfport, Mississippi and spend a couple days there. But we did marching, drilling, and that's about it. Then they uh, sent us to uh, Mississippi State College for college training. They sent a thousand of us there. And uh, we got there, we rushed and got into rooms in the old building and wherever we could find a room with our, whoever was we could get in with and put, had four to a room and uh, I was fortunate enough to get in the new one new building they had there. The rest were pretty, pretty old and decrepit. But uh, this this building was a wing of a uh, an eight-shaped building for students there, Mississippi State, but, which wasn't really operating during the war. And. Uh, in this room, where four people were assigned in that room, and one of them was a boy from Huntington that I never, I never knew existed, but we'd been fast friends ever since. We both went through buying school together, and uh, since we were in the first squadron, we only got to spend about a month there. We were supposed to get ten hours flying time in a uh, Piper J5 and uh, we were supposed to be there five months, but I got four hours of flying time <laughs> and uh, was only there a month. Next stop was uh, San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center, which is now Lackland Air Place. There, uh, this buddy that I met there, I, I roomed with in that uh, college training t detachment uh, was, uh, he and I were there in classification center together. It took about, oh, at least a month of testing. They tested everything. They tested coordination and depth perception, physical examinations. They were pretty severe. And uh, at that time, uh, my buddy, had a little sickness, so he wasn't able to graduate to pre-flight with us. So pre-flight was the next 
uh, stop on the agenda, and they had the, it, it right across the street from the where the uh, classification center was. They uh, after uh, about two weeks in, in uh, pre-flight, we were shipped on out to uh, um, our primary flight training. And uh, it's a little difficult to remember just what dates were which because uh, I'm getting old, I guess. <laughs> anyway, at primary flight training, we flew PT-19s, which were uh, low wing, single model, single wing, single engine monoplane uh, with the seat in the front, seat in the back, and controls in both. And we communicated with each other with a Gosport tube. It was a, a tube that ran around the, along the fuselage and plugged into our flying helmets. So you could talk into that and be heard, or each one of us had one. We had no electrical system on them. We had to crank them to start them on the ground. And <laughs> we uh, went, got to upper class there, and the upper class, under class, we did most of our uh, flight training and ground school. And the upper class, we did uh, more elaborate, uh, air, learned aerobatics. Etc. And one day, uh, my instructor was wanted to show me how to do inverted turns, and he said they're not supposed to do them; they're forbidden. But he thought maybe I could handle it, and uh, we went up. and He told me to roll the airplane over on its back, which I did, and hold the nose up. He talked to me. He says, uh, "Hold the." A lot of pressure on that stick to hold the nose up, which I did, and then he says, now give it a little aileron. So I did, and we were flying around along upside down uh, in a slow turn to the right. We just kept going. He didn't say anything. He didn't. I thought he might comment on what I was doing. He didn't say anything, didn't say anything, so I tired of hanging on that seat belt and I rolled out and looked in the back seat to see what he would say and I couldn't see him. I thought maybe he'd crouch down in the cockpit. But uh, I raised up in the cockpit, you know, just like that to look and he was gone. <laughs> I was shocked. But uh, I finally located him a parachute off in the horizon someplace. And I headed down to this point and I saw him on the ground picking up his parachute, just throwing the thing together. And I couldn't land there, so I flew back to the base. Fortunately, I had enough time and I could do that. And uh, reported to the uh, squawk box that I needed another airplane and another instructor. I said, my instructor fell out of the airplane. Oh, they. They panicked, but we did. We did. They did find him about six o'clock that evening, standing, sitting on some farmer's porch, who had no telephones at that time. And oh, the next day, uh, after we, he, they finally found him, and he got me a pass, and we went to uh, Stamford, the city, to buy us newspaper. So we got newspaper accounts of the thing. And of course, they said a. I come up to my hometown too, and that uh, that was something else. Okay, after you uh, finished training, then where did you go? Well, we went through next. We went through basic training at Greenville, Texas. We flew BT-13s there, and uh, that was where we got our first night flying experiences. And uh, landing at night was kind of a chore. For, we lost some cadets there in accidents. I had lost one cadet uh, 
in an accident caused by not recognizing the torque of that engine, we uh, we had a uh, rudder control on the, in the airplane that when we took off we'd roll all the anti-torque in one direction to the left I think I, as I remember take off and because the airplane had a tendency to turn to the right on takeoff with full power and uh, when we landed then we had to screw it back to zero because we did the opposite thing to land and we were supposed to put it on zero and one airplane it was after they uh, was going after he landed he forgot to roll the trim out and the next cadet that flew that airplane didn't roll the, roll the trim out of the, uh, the airplane torque of the airplane caused the airplane to just climb and crash right on the runway. And hit two airplanes that were refueling and one of the tragedies there. From there we went to uh, Frederick, Oklahoma for twin engine advanced. We, uh, we had a, a choice of going to twin engine or advanced or single engine advanced. Single engine were destined to be fighter pilots and the twin engine pilots would, were to fly multi-engine airplanes. Then uh, we, uh, after Greenville, Texas, we went to, like I said, we went to uh, Frederick, Oklahoma for our advanced training and we flew a UC-78 airplane there, which we uh, called it a double-breasted cub, but it was a much bigger airplane than that. And uh, that was our main airplane we flew in advance. And that's where we graduated. And we were supposed to have a big dance. Had our wives there. She'd come down about a month earlier and uh, bought a brand new formal for the big dance that they were having in the gymnasium when they presented our wings and our, our commissions. And so, they, which they did, maybe, here we go. When they gave us our, our uh, commissions, they said, now, go back to the barracks and put your flying suit on. He says, we're going to fly. We're behind on time. <laughs> My wife was just broken hearted, they didn't even have it yet. Anyway, those were some of the things that happened to us. And uh, for a, my name is at the end of the alphabet, so I was always I'm near the end of the line <laughs> all through training, you know. And uh, they didn't have assignments for all of us, so I became an instructor. Just you are an instructor. That's what I did. I flew with the cadets in the underclass. Uh, I didn't like that training command too well, and I, I volunteered for everything that came up. I really wanted to go to Europe. I'm glad I didn't. But uh, they came up with a uh, an assignment. Uh, they wanted, I think, twelve flying officers, this one place. You know, I couldn't really read those orders, but I, could, I determined we were going to Panama. But while we were uh, billeted at the Floridian Hotel there in uh, Miami, we uh, were issued foot lockers. And these, they had a Camillus knife, mosquito nets, and all kinds of jungle fighting, fighting uh, equipment. Well, I think I'm going to the Philippines, but I, you know, that's where, anyway, we took that all. Took a, they took us, the next flight that came up was C-54, flying us to uh, Panama. When uh, we arrived there, we got out and 
showed the uh, uh, greeting officer uh, <laughs> our orders. He says, we figured we'd go to East. He said, no, you're, you're going to be assigned right here, right to this squadron. And so there I was. But uh, then I went to see the colonel, the commanding colonel of the 3rd Bomb Squadron, to uh, ask him questions and greet him, you know, what's his military custom, courtesy. And I came up with a question. I said, what do you have to fly here? He said, B-24s. I said, they told me in, his, in the States that I was too small to fly a B-24. He says, you'll fly them here. He says, that's all we've got. And I never had any problem flying a B-24. I thought it was a good airplane. But uh, we were involved in anti-submarine patrols. And uh, we had 12-hour flights flying a pattern. We had uh, a navigator and a bombardier and a, a uh, co-pilot and a pilot. And we f we'd fly those. Our, our uh, automatic pilots would work pretty well, although they would precess and we'd have to watch them, you know, so we couldn't get in the seat and go to sleep. And, uh, they, this was a Tell me about your brother. Oh, this, yeah, the, after I was there in, uh, in Panama, uh, about two weeks or so, and uh, I got a letter from my father and said that he, my younger brother had joined the Navy. And being able to uh, censor my own mail, I, could, I, I wrote him a letter and told him to con contact him me if he got through the canal. And uh, about a week later I got a telephone call and here it was my brother Stanley uh, on the telephone and I asked him, I said, how long will you be here? Uh, he said, well I don't know, I've been here a month already. He was assigned to the <laughs> Naval Operating Base. And we saw each other every once in a while for the next year it was together. Another coincidence. And uh, I had an opportunity to go to Guatemala. We had a base there and we, whenever they have a f sinking in a place like uh, uh, Jamaica, they would send a couple airplanes up there fully loaded and fully, you know, with armed search for possible uh, to uh, torpedo in that area. And uh, same thing, we went to Cuba. We had several trips to Cuba, which were just R&R &R for the base personnel that had no way to get off those bases there. And this is near the end of the war. And another Coincidence happened when I was uh, I had I'd flown a B-24 down to pick up a new contingent of men for uh, assigned be, would be assigned to our squadron because they were always changing places, you know. So we landed there. I landed there at Albrook Field and told the uh, crew chief we were going to go to the PX. We didn't have a much of a base exchange at David where I was stationed. And I said, do you assemble this, these crew under the wing of the airplane? Because the sun was real nice and bright. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back in just a little bit. So when we got back, they were all at attention, nice and at ease, you know. One of the uh, crew says, sir, uh, didn't, are you from Huntington? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, didn't you used to wash windows at the Sweets shop there. I said, yes, I did. He said, you, you're from my hometown, real close. So I had got him assigned to my 
my crew as a radio operator. And we were, he was flying with me when the war was over in, in uh, Europe. We received the news over the Bomber Command net. Uh, let's see, I, where would they go from here? There ought to be an end to this story. Yeah, uh, well, you returned to uh, what base were you mustered out from? Oh, uh, I, I was home on a, on a leave. My father had died, and I had gone home on a leave and uh, ordered to return to Panama. But uh, they had assigned me to Jefferson Barracks in New Orleans to. Uh, get my orders and go back overseas. And so when I got there, I, uh, they went over my records and they said I had too many points. I didn't have to go, I wouldn't go back overseas. So that's, they gave me a temporary duty leave and this was the last of uh, 1945. So after my temporary duty to even then uh, report to uh, San Antonio for a discharge or separation or whatever, which I did and I was separated then in 1946 after Christmas. We were there, we were there for Christmas and the, uh, the railroads were just crowded to we were shoulder to shoulder in the railroads. And so another lieutenant and myself decided to hitchhike home at that time. And something I'm leaving out there is the offer of, they wanted me to stay in on active duty and go to jet pilot training. We had no jets during World War II. I mean, we didn't. The, uh, I guess they might have had a couple in Europe, but I decided I had had, uh, I just joined the reserve, which I did, and I stayed for my <clears throat> 28 years, and two months, and 20 days. Uh, required retirement. After 28 years of commission service, it was required if you were in the rank of lieutenant colonel or below. I think a colonel could stay for 30 years. But then after that, we, uh, as a gray area, you had to be 60 to collect your compensation. So that's how far I went. And uh, of course, I belonged to the units there in Fort Wayne, uh, a flying unit we, at Bearfield who had AT-6s. And we really weren't doing much of anything except keeping our skills and our touch for flying because at that time we were, people were watching for aircraft from overseas all the way, all the, uh, tower operators in on the railroad had uh, field glasses and early warning systems were in effect. Do you remember that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we flew flew uh, there at Bare Field for oh I don't I can't remember just exactly how many how long I stayed in that or they decided they couldn't afford to have us burning that gasoline and we. Uh, continued in the reserve till we started going to meetings and held, held meetings for to keep up your point credits. And uh, I had one, I had taken correspondence courses, two to additional points. Then they, uh, they re required us to go to uh, 1947, called uh, almost all the uh, reserve 
ready reservists up to go to uh, Godman Field in Fort Knox, in Louisville, Kentucky. So we went down there, and here again we were flying AT 6s. We would fly in the morning, in the afternoon we'd go to our lectures. And the same thing, we were flying up and down the Ohio River. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this was a kind of a, a meeting to uh, start the Air Force. This was the beginning of the Air Force. This yeah. is the last of the Army Air Corps. Uh, not really. Uh, they, of course, they still have a, an Air Corps in the Army, but this was when the large commissions were all transferred to the to the Air Force. And let me see, where am I at? Uh, tell me about uh, your wife at the war. Oh, my wife, well, while I was serving in the uh, flight squadrons, my wife took a job in defense plan and working on aircraft engines, uh, producing parts for aircraft engines at the Studebaker in Fort Wayne. And she worked diligently and she says that she thought maybe she might be working on parts that I would would be in the airplanes that I flew. But uh, since we had Pratt Whitney's on the B-24s, <coughs> the, uh, and she was working on the right cycle of engines, uh, I don't suppose that ever happened. You got any more prompts there? Tell me about uh, about your uh, the, your reserve duty with the Air Force Academy. Oh, yes. Uh, well, in the 1964, I received a, an appointment as a liaison officer for the Air Force Academy, which is probably the best duty I served. It was quite enjoyable to uh, counsel young men. And I, of course, I was assigned the, the counties in this particular area, and I would uh, attend high schools, uh, counsel with the guidance counselors, and show them the opportunities of the Air Force Academy and what a, a boy would really need to be able to be successful at his nomination. And, uh, that we had no girls at the academy at that time, so it was all boys. And I was, I had, I was with them for 12 years, made a lot of good friends on active duty tours at the academy. Uh, Governor Ed Whitcomb was a, uh, I think he was lieutenant governor at that time. I met him there, and we, uh, he and his wife, and me and a couple of other went out to in the evening to dinner, and uh, then he told us then he was running for governor when he got back. So we about a well, I guess might have been a year later. I I was visiting my daughter who worked for a WKJG TV station here, and I stopped in to see her, and here she was sitting there talking to Pat Whitcomb. Ed's, he had started his campaign and uh, he was on the, the uh, TV program. They, uh, he gave me a copy of his book, uh, Escape from Corregidor, and I it. That, that, which I think it's out of print now, but I have a couple copies of it. It was a real experience escaping from the Japanese in Corregidor. And there was several boys, about, I think there was probably four or five boys that I had helped get their nominations and complete their required testing and physical examinations and go to the academy. One, one of the boys didn't make it in, a, in the academies, he, he stayed only a short time. 
he was broken hearted but to tell me about he, but he just couldn't cut the math and things like that happened. Okay, after uh, uh, you, you got out of the reserves, when did you retire? Well, I, re I retired in 1980, 1980 when I was 60 years old, which you completely retired. Uh, but this is the age where you can receive your compensation, your pension, more or less. The Air Force call this retirement pay. No, retainer pay. That's called, they call it retainer pay. It's not, they don't call it a pension. And also, it's probably due to the fact that they can call you back to active duty if they want to. That would be a kind of a ridiculous thing for me. <laughs> And uh, you went to farming when you? Well, yeah, not right away. I, I lived in Fort Wayne for a while, and I was went back to working on the railroad, which I had seniority that carried over. And uh, my wife uh, didn't want to live in the town anymore. She wanted to live in the country, so we bought a farm, an 80-acre farm up by Tri Lakes. And uh, I attempted to do the farming myself. Didn't, this was too much to do for working on the railroad and making a living, and so I began to rent the, the uh, fields out. And not uh, for a while, I, I put the farm, the land in the conservation reserve, and uh, so I had a large, long, uh, grassy field that I could land the airplane on. So I, I rented a lot of airplanes and I kicked around the idea of buying my own airplane to, and keeping the landing strip there. But I got to talking to some commercial pilots that flew for the uh, grain companies and they would tell me how much insurance they had to carry on their airplanes, something like six million dollars uh, for your liability, you know. I thought about, I don't want to do a lot of flying, especially for on, on my own. So uh, I gave up the idea. I did rent airplanes, but I didn't want to own one. Okay. Uh. Might add that uh, when I retired from the Air Force and the railroad, approximately the same day, same time, I was, so uh, it all came together for me. Yeah. Okay, I want to show uh, a picture, and uh, Bob will have a, a little comment about this picture. <clears throat> this is a picture of uh, our entire third bomb squadron. We were stationed at David in uh, Panama, right close to the Puerto Rican border, the Costa Rican border. And uh, that's a 110-foot wingspan on that B-24 with the whole, whole crew. Of course, you can't tell who's who. I've, I've searched for myself in this picture, but I can't find it. 